Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel for our weekly content. Today's guest is the Power Slap middleweight world champion, John Machine Davis. John, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm doing great today. Appreciate y'all having me on and uh, reaching out to talk to me. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. Thank you, mate. And um, yeah, really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. We've been, uh, been fans of Power Slap for, for a little while. And obviously, you're one of the, one of the founding uh, athletes, I guess, in the house. Um, so it's awesome to, to chat to you and, and obviously talk to the champ as well. So um, yeah, really looking forward to this conversation, mate. So thank you very much for your time as well. Of course, you know, it's always a, an honor and a pleasure to not only get to meet and talk to new people because of this, but also, you know, any questions I can answer to explain further, because there's a million different questions about what we do and how we do it. So, you know, anything I can do to help further, I, you know, not just my career, but power slap as a whole for people to understand, I, I, have, I have no choice. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good, mate, because it's, it's a fascinating sport. It's obviously a very new sport. And, um, you know, it pretty, it pretty much is what it says in the tin. Um, and, you know, for me watching it, I, I've done martial arts in one way or another for many, many years. Um, and one thing I've always prided myself on is trying to avoid getting hit as much as possible. And obviously you're in a sport where you, you know, it, it literally comes down to a, a flip of a coin on whether you potentially get hit or not. Um, so I, I find that, yeah, I find it mental in all fairness. So fair play for being an athlete in that sport because it looks painful mentality definitely i'd say plays the biggest factor in that <laughs> yeah yeah i bet so you're gonna have to tell us all about this mate because the, the obvious question is how does somebody even get into to high slap fighting so like tell us about your sort of your sort of upbringing your background like where did you grow up well, I'm from Northeast Ohio. I grew up in a tiny little podunk town called Homeworth, Ohio. You know, uh, farm life out there, blue collar, pretty much everywhere in the general area. I grew up on an ostrich farm, so my life story's been different from the beginning. So really, ha you know, starting off with, with crazy, you know, basically velociraptors living in my backyard as a child. <laughs> so my life's never really been normal. But, you know, got into sports a little bit when I was a kid. Um, I'm very competitive, but I didn't really, you know, find that out till I was older. So sports through elementary school was just kind of, oh, everybody else is doing this. You know, I enjoyed football. Uh, I wrestled in elementary for a little bit and then didn't get back into it until junior high. But junior high and high school, you know, football, wrestling, uh, track for one year. And come to find out track was probably my best sport. So I should have done it way sooner. But I was I was too busy, you know, messing around, trying to have fun, getting into all sorts of mischief compared to focusing on an athletic career as a, as a young one. So that was that was my loss. And then um, kind of fast forward career wise when it comes to athletics, you know, have a family started working a job, got into uh, jujitsu and Muay Thai at Next Level Alliance that I train at. Shout out to Edward Bean and the Bean family, my coaches. Um, had I not walked into that gym one day, you know, probably a little bit overweight and out of shape, hadn't really done much with myself in a long time and, you know, really found that competitive edge again to want to do stuff and, and get up and um, was interested in amateur MMA. That was how, you know, my, my introduction into combat sports other than high school wrestling really started to happen so as i was looking into the local area for the amateur mma scene i wanted to see the guys who i thought were going to be in my weight class i wanted to see you know what promotions were around here so i was really digging into social media and f trying to find all this stuff and i unlike some other people who got reached out to i stumbled across this little slapping for money <clears throat> we need competitors and at first, I mean, I laughed at it. I can't even lie. I laughed at it. And I was like, there's no way that's even a real thing. Who's actually doing that? You know, like most everybody, I'd seen the clips online from over in Russia or Poland or wherever they were, you know, posted up in a behind a bar or a gas station parking lot, smacking the shit out of each other. <laughs> but uh, once, once I was really, you know, looking into the amateur scene and found that ad, 
finally one day I commented on it and then got a response and then you know lo and behold from me thinking I was going to be funny to the next thing you know this you know this is my home gym that I'm sitting in right now this is where I started the conversations about getting into power slap before it was even called power slap so you know I started my training right in here I started you know whatever phone calls and paperwork I was doing contract wise everything was done sitting in this spot trying to figure out you know what what actually was going to happen next and then that's when we had the qualifier event that was before the house so that kind of opened the doors of whether or not it was actually going to even make it you know at the beginning of the qualifier event a lot of people some of us heard, heard rumors that it was for Dana White or through Dana White and then once we all finally got down there and realized that we weren't going to get our organs taken and left in a bathtub full of ice because that was the ongoing joke that we all thought was going to happen <laughs> once we were in Vegas but uh, once once that kind of you know was gone and we're standing in the UFC apex Dana White's walking up to you and shaking your hand <laughs> and talking to you and you're getting all these crazy medicals done you know it's it's been a whirlwind ever since I you know went down there for the very first one that's absolutely fucking mental, isn't it? Yeah. That is mental. So with, with like the, the jiu-jitsu and the amateur MMA and stuff, did you ever ever have any bouts or compete or anything? Um, I've done two jiu-jitsu competitions, real small ones. One was in a cage for a local promotion, BCM promotions, and the other one was just at uh, a gym about 45 minutes from here where they usually did the, the white and blue belts. But okay. other than that, I'd re- I, I never got the chance to compete in MMA yet. So that's probably what, I, you know, whenever I'm done with all of this, I would still like to entertain that in the future. Are you still doing jujitsu? Yeah, I was just at class Thursday night for sparring and no-gi jujitsu. That's amazing, and that's so yeah. fun. Yeah, and what about you now? I'm still a two-stripe white belt, and I've got nothing really in, in Muay Thai. Luckily, again, the, the background that I have between wrestling and, you know, I'd had a small stint in the Marine Corps. And then, again, I spent a lot of my teen years fighting my friends in cornfields, so it might not have been perfect <laughs> form, but the toughness came, the toughness <laughs> comes in there. So after I get my, my ass kicked a little bit at training, someone can help me fix those issues real quick usually. Yeah, good. And uh, I think on the show, you, you referenced at one point that you, you had, a, you know, sort of hard times when you were growing up. So, so tell us a little bit more about um, what that was like for you, mate. You kind of just mentioned then about scrapping with mates in cornfields and, you know, what, what was upbringing like for you? Was there lots of, well, lots, lots of punch ups and fighting and that type of thing then? Um, that more so wasn't till the teen years, I guess the hard times started, you know, as a, as a young kid, I started drinking early, um, before I was even a teenager, honestly, I think I started regularly getting drunk at 11. Wow. So, you know, that was, yes, it's absolutely insane. And, you know, I, I have a child now that's 11. Yeah. So do I. Yeah. That's one of the biggest fears that like, oh my God, at 11, I was regularly starting to get drunk and, you know, you don't realize that alcoholism is a thing when you're a little kid i mean it was the 90s when i first lived out first lived out in that town of homeworth so there wasn't a whole lot of mental health information you know mental health was a big thing because as a little kid i didn't understand why i was so different compared to everybody else so that kind of led into oh well this you know the alcohol made me feel different and then you know it was every other weekend a little bit just starting off And then by the time I was 13, you know, parents had uh, gotten a divorce. Um, My grandmother had passed away. So, you know, some real groundbreaking things of of the foundation of my life that I thought it was going to be there forever. You know, as a little kid, I, I hoped that as an adult, I would take over the farm. Not like it was making any money or anything crazy, but you have those dreams as a little kid that get crushed. So... It was definitely, you know, an eye-opening experience, but from the young age, again, like I said, starting to, you know, experiment with alcohol at 11. By the time I was 12, I was smoking weed and, you know, probably probably just entering into, you know, the pill era because that was such... Everyone was doing pills, whether it was your your parents or your family, you know, getting them as a prescription. And you hear them say, oh, you know, that my back hurt. I did this, yada, yada. And, you know, you don't again, you don't understand and you don't think about that stuff when you're a little kid. 
when you say pills, because in the UK, when we say pills, we talk about ecstasy. Um, are you talking, what are you talking about in the, the US? Is it oxys or something or? Painkillers. So Vicodin, yeah. Percocet, Valium, stuff like that. And, you know, by the time I was at 13, anything I could get my hands on, you know, as that terrible as this is going to sound, as terrible as this is going to sound, my, my game would be to take it and then find out what it was supposed to do afterwards. <laughs> no way. Yeah, it was all. Oh, I, I mean, I was before I had my license, I was living the bar life because, you know, people weren't watching us all the time. We were out, you know, basically doing the latchkey kid stuff where, you know, depending on where I was at, if I was with my cousin or, you know, at a buddy's house, you next thing you know, you're 13 with a six pack of Budweiser smoking cigarettes, playing pool and an old broke down trailer because y'all have nothing to do on the weekend but it it really it really carried on and ramped up as i got older it's a real problem in america isn't it the painkillers like we don't have we have that same problem but we don't have it i don't think we have the the doctors pushing it nowhere near as much because we don't have our doctors don't have any benefit to give it to you so you actually you know really if you're getting them in the uk you need them unless you're getting them from the black market or whatever but in America, they seem to be pushed on everyone. There's that Netflix documentary that's recently come out, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, our, our healthcare isn't privatised in the UK. Well, I mean, there is an option to have have private healthcare, yeah. but primarily we've got the, the National Health Service. Um, so yeah, there isn't that that financial incentive of of medical professionals to push certain drugs onto people. And that's that's really what you you know those documentaries. When I watch those now, I realize why I've lost so many friends, family, you know, f- close family members to drug addiction because you start off with all that time of everyone could get pills anywhere. So you were either buying prescriptions from you know Joe Blow down the road because he had four of them coming in, or you know you you had one coming in. It, you know, again, finding that stuff as a young kid, you don't realize actually what's going on. And then by the time before I even get to adulthood is when you realize, you know, they've they've found out that that's going on. They're making restrictions for the medical system. And then you wonder why a pill that is probably only worth two dollars at the time. Now you're paying 10 bucks a pop. You and your friends are are riding around, you know, scratching up change, scrapping cans because we were basically, you know, we were full blown drug addicts before I got out of high school. I can't speak for everybody else that was, you know, around me at the time, but I guaranteed I was up into my 20s. I battled back and forth with as I do good for a while. Again, this, you know, wrestling season would start. And I'd know, hey, I, I got to put the booze down. I got to quit getting so messed up. I can't keep doing that. And then it would take one bad tournament on weekend, one bad, you know, I didn't get my, I didn't get the varsity spot, uh, any anything like that that would just kind of be like, oh well, it doesn't matter now. So I can just start being my old self again. And then you know, many times have I fought through that of thinking hey you know this is the way to feel a little bit better for a while but basically i was just putting putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound uh over and over again thinking that i was still going to be all right until you know my early 20s i think 25 was when i finally met my wife and before we started having a family so before that i had i had just quit drinking before her and i got together because um i've lost one stepbrother to suicide and he was also you know in and out of drinking and a little bit of drug if I understand right. And then my oldest stepbrother, who a couple years ago we finally lost after years of battling, uh, battling through rehab. And, you know, it, it came back. And unfortunately, because, you know, I don't know if it was the fentanyl stuff and, you know, families have kind of fallen apart and in, out of touch over time. But, you know, I've, I've lost two people that helped mold me growing up to that specifically you know not including other family members or friends that i know in the past that it it played a factor in them not being here or being around anymore yeah that's tough man and then i I guess during that sort of period because that's quite a long period then i guess if you were kind of like early to mid 20s from like 11 that's you know a good sort of 10 15 years of of battling with that sort of stuff and then you know kind of going back to the the teenage years when you were sort of getting in scraps and, and a bit of trouble i mean you know what sort of you know, where did you find yourself as a result of the, the drinking and the drugs? You know, did you ever get yourself in trouble with the law or anything? Uh, they, I almost got expelled in seventh grade. 
So I had, uh, you know, it wasn't even explosive fireworks. They're the ones that shoot all the sparkles out of it. But of course, you know, being being a, a dumb 13 year old, I had a, a case that used to keep uh, a calendar in it. So I took the calendar out and inside of it, I had a lighter, the fireworks. I think I had some caffeine pills and um, I don't know, like a pocket knife, something stupid to just keep in there. It wasn't anything extreme because it had, it had it been alcohol or the actual drugs that I was doing at the time, it would have probably been a worst case scenario. But they, they, I think the school had inclination that I, you know, I had always been struggling with my grades. I never really got in trouble until that point. But I definitely, you know, was probably had a red flag on my next to my name in their filing cabinet of, you know, if someone's going to disrupt class, if someone's going to, you know, not do their work, you know, I had all the potential and the intelligence to do the, do the work and get the grades I needed to. I just didn't, I just didn't want to do it. You know, the school setting wasn't for me how they do it. If they would have sat us down and said, take this motor apart and put it back together, I could have probably figured that out way easier than how are you properly going to form a sentence? You know, that stuff didn't, it never clicked or interested me. So for me to actually pay attention to it was very hard. And that's why, you know, an easy thing would be go home in sixth grade. I have three F's and I don't know what's going on. And the next thing you know, you wonder why I'm out having, having problems getting into trouble. But the, the expulsion hearing, you know, in seventh grade, I, I had like a week out of school. I was on probation for half a year, parental house arrest, which I don't even know how that's a thing because you're already on house arrest at home with your parents anyway, but whatever, you know, they were just whatever they could throw on there to make it, make an example out of me. And they told me that if I ever got anything more than a detention through high school again and junior high, that they were going to kick me out of the district. So I you know I had, I had to learn, unfortunately, I had to learn to get away with all the bad stuff I was doing early. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, I was about to say, man, that's a long time to go without getting in any trouble. Yeah, I was so, about yeah. to say, fucking, I would have been gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, got, I would get detention. Very often I would get detention because that was when cell phones first became a thing. At least for me, I finally was able to get one through high school. Mm. And, you know, that was the battle of you can't have that. And if you, compl- if you argued with them, you could probably get suspended. So I'd give them the phone and I'd get detention. But the p- problem with detention was my football coach would walk through in the morning and he'd walk back out and see me and go, what are you doing here? So I would have to suffer double at practice because I got in trouble again. <laughs> and then were you always quite sporty there, mate? So you said you kind of dabbled in a number of different sports. So it doesn't sound like academically it was really your thing. Um, and I think that's similar for so many people in fairness that they kind of have a completely different learning style and um, prefer just to be a bit hands on. Um, so were you always quite sporty and athletic or did like the, the drink and drugs kind of limit your uh, athletic pursuits somewhat? Um, I'd always liked sports, you know, it was, I'm the odd ball out when it comes to my family. No one was a, a standout athlete in anything really. So I never really had the proper motivation you'll say from, uh, anyone at home about if you keep doing it and push through, you know, you could do this, that, or the other. It was more so, it was a privilege to do sports. So it was a constant battle of me getting in trouble in school, whether I was going to be allowed to continue or not. You know, one parent might say, hey, he needs to be taken out of that because he doesn't have the grades. While the other one was like, well, I think that's the only thing keeping him going through school is doing the sports. So it was, it was a toss up. And again, I really, I'd say my junior my junior and senior year were probably my best years of wrestling and football. Mm-hmm. Um, I I thought I might go play football at a D3 college around here, you know, just a real small school because they needed bodies. But um, other than that, you know, I, I, I again, I could do I would could, I got in the top 10, you know, whatever it means in high school sports, obviously, but the top 10 fastest and strongest for football. So, you know, that's cool. That's really what you want to look forward to and hope you're going to have a great senior year. But again, I was too focused on, you know, partying on the weekend then at that point or what, you know, what were we going to do at this or, you know, what, whatever it could have been in all reality, because it could have been anything what we were getting that, you know, as a teenage boy at that point on the football team, you're what girls can we talk to? Who can we have out from the other school as a, as a rival party? You know, what, what mischief can we cause? So 
if, if, me, if, if I had some better direction, I probably could have been a way better athlete back then. But um, I always like running. I always enjoyed a long distance run because that runner's high of being able to push through it. So, you know, that was something that even after party, people would get up, you know, it'd be 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Everyone's still hung over and drunk. And they'd be asking my buddies, like, why is he out? Out there laps around the cornfield and they just take it crazy <laughs> so <laughs> that's fucking amazing yeah and then um i think you had a short stint in the marines as well yeah uh right after high school um probably a couple months after we graduated so i think i was 19 once i finally was on my way down to paris island uh for the marine corps boot camp um that honestly, as, as rough as that experience was, it kind of saved my life because it got me away from all of the shit that was going on here at home. You know, if I understand correctly, there was a certain spot <clears throat> we all used to hang out at that basically the, not the, not the feds to tie them all in together, but dudes with uh, automatic weapons and body armor came and breaking down the door to raid the, the spot that I'm talking about. So... Things were definitely, you know, could have gone a complete, total different direction. So I was grateful that I missed that. But uh, finally get down to Paris Island, you know, I got hurt after the first month of training with my opposite shoulder. So that kind of really put a, put a damper on me being able to do that because it was the time period where they needed people, but they didn't absolutely people so unfortunately I got hurt sent to medical I tried my best to be able to stay in and unfortunately was not able to but I got an honorable medical discharge and you know that was that was the jail I guess I'll relate it to that was the jail that I needed to go to at that time to get me to get me a little bit of taste of what the world was going to do to me if I didn't try and get myself better in the long run. You know, granted, I had some issues afterwards, again, you know, battling through the, the, just all of it, but it was, it was a life changing experience. I met friends down there that I still have to this day. You know, we, we saw parts of boot camp that most people will never see. You know, I've talked to guys that did their four to eight years and got out and when i explained to them what was going on down there at least you know we were in the we were in the shadows of what was going on down there so we really had to see the the darker side of things you know not only were we dealing with the folks like myself that had a physical injury but you a lot of people would snap they don't realize when some folks go to boot camp you know they they end up with the ptsd but living down there and mentally can't handle it so we had to live with those folks you have to deal with the people who tried taking their own lives you have to take care of the guys that have completely just completely just turned against the the military and they just want to go home so they're doing anything and everything they can you know like if you've ever had to stand over someone at night while they sleep because you you don't want something to happen to them when they're obviously faking it, things can get a little bit rough. You know, some guys might get beat up. Some guys might get woke up every hour because it's like if I have to be up in the middle of the night to make sure you're not doing something stupid, I'm waking your dumb ass up too. You know, it was, again, a wild experience that I'm sure I go on and on about for hours with that one. Yeah, I bet. So then when you came out, I guess to, to some extent, as you say, that's kind of like what you needed to, to kind of open your eyes to some extent. But I guess it was a period where you'd kind of gotten out, right? You'd gotten out of the life. So you'd you'd obviously found this new career. You were, you know, kind of away from the drink and drugs and obviously the, all the bad shit that was happening back at home. But now you were out of the Marine, you were injured um, and kind of back to square one to some extent. Like how, where was your head at at that point? Um, yeah, square one is exactly where I was at. I pretty much started from scratch and then, you know, I didn't tell anybody I was coming home at first because I felt a lot of shame. Um, I felt like I had started something and was not able to com complete it. So in my mind, you know, as a 19 year old kid who just was told I was a cockroach for four months and 23 days on Paris Island, you go home and you know, it's not like I was in the best mental space when I left to go down there anyhow. So once I got out, you know, I was happy as hell to get out and finally, you know, feel freedom again. But I felt lost in, in a different way that I had also never felt before. So as much as I needed it, and, and I can say that now because, you know, I've made it through everything else that happened afterwards and, 
um, I love I love my life now. I love the family that I have here and the support system that I have even on my worst days. But it was crazy because I I got home and I'm just I let I went to live with my cousin and some of his friends and you know they they were already house near near a, a college. So that was that was probably not the best option, but again, I I felt like I was coming home and I hadn't completed what I was supposed to and you know hiding in that in that shameful feeling. Um, I just kind of wanted to remove myself from the world, but also I didn't because I had to be a part of the world again. You know, I, I think my first day home, just sitting there, my sister and my cousin were there and they both just were kind of looking at me and I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, again, the, mm -hmm. the lost feeling is not one I can explain very well with words because it was so... I was so grateful to not be there, but I was also extremely sad to be back sitting at home, not doing what I thought I was going to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%, mate. And, and then sort of like, I guess, fast forwarding a, a few years. So you said you were about 25, you, you, now, you met your now wife and you'd at that point, I think, just quit drinking, you said. So what was the, the revelation to, for you to, to make that, that step? Because, um, you know, I've, I've not had like a serious problem with drinking, but I've been sober for about a year and certainly had some, um, you know, bad behaviors in the past as a result of drinking. Um, and there was definitely a, a sort of build up of things that led to me finally, like the, the switch kind of turning almost in my head to, to stop. Like what, what happened for you to, to turn that switch? Um, again, uh, I was, I was to a good place where I could, I felt confident that I could drink a little bit and still be okay. But there was also the times again, where if I had a bad day, I didn't know whether I was going to come home and drink a six pack or if I was going to drink a six pack and then a full bottle of Jack because both could happen just as easy. Um, but what I'd say what had happened was my stepbrother who was a year and uh, I got a couple days older than me cause he loved to remind me of it. He actually took his own life and, um, he was one of the people that you know we used to drink all the time that was that was our thing on the weekends we were going out we were going to party we would we if you don't know if y'all know what a four loco is but when those when those were popping okay it was it was a dangerous drink it looks like a, a big can and it would get you instantly messed up so our pregame was to drink one of those before we went to the party <laughs> and then we would go party with a bunch of people but um you know he he definitely had a, a bit of a drinking problem and um, I didn't know everything that was going on in his life at that time because, uh, you know, I had just I had my own apartment. I was living on my own, uh, you know, kind of finally fe feeling my way into what being an adult and a functioning member of society should be. And then, uh, you know, it was the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I was sitting there by myself watching the uh, same DVD because I only had two. I was, I was just watching those <laughs> over and over again. But I, I get the phone call that something had happened to him. And, you know, I didn't know what was going on. But long, long story short on all of that, he had finally, you know, lost the battle of what he was going through and decided to take his own life. And I knew that drugs and alcohol very well, you know, most likely paid played a factor in that and you know somewhat whether it would have not happened um i can't sit here and say that but i knew that those were some things that very well played a factor and my own struggles with mental health throughout my entire life um i didn't i couldn't entertain that option ever again because he was one that he you know he even told me years prior i could, I could never be able to do that you know and i can remember his words distinctly in my mind you know the the conversation we were having at that time and then fast forward a few years later he's he's done it and you know really really having to grasp what was going on and the magnitude of the situation once you find out that you know he he is gone this is not this is not an attempt this is not a he's going to be all right this is it's it's over because he finally you know he pushed the border too far and he crossed the line that you can't uncross so that was uh that was the moment I decided to walk away from drinking. You know, like you said, I've had a couple of beers, one, you know, one beer at a time since then a little bit, but I haven't touched liquor since 2015. I have no desire to touch liquor. Um, just thinking about it honestly makes my stomach hurt more so because I know, you know, all those times of fighting through the after effect, the hangover, the fucking throwing up everywhere, feeling like trash. 
um, you know, I didn't want that on top of what it did to me mentally, you know. So that was that was my breaking point for that of needing to walk away from alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry to hear about your stepbrother, first of all, John. Thank you very and, much. Um, I'm glad that it was, you know, you were able to kind of use that as a catalyst to then obviously change your life around. It's amazing. Okay, so you met your wife and then I think you were a mechanic or a welder by trade, is that right? Yeah, welder. I'm a machine operator now for the most part. I do a bunch of different stuff. I could do anything blue collar. I just usually go with a blue collar worker at the moment. <laughs> yeah, nice. So we're somewhat living a normal life and then we, we kind of jump right back to where we kind of like came in and then you're, you're kind of training at Alliance, doing a bit of jujitsu and MMA and you tell your coaches that you want to be a, a slap fight athlete. How did that go down? Me, because I'm a very anxious guy. You know, walking up to anybody to tell them that, especially someone, you know, it's it's a lot about respect in martial arts, I'm sure, as you both know. So, you know, walking up to my coach and being like, oh, God, you know, I didn't want him to be like, get the fuck out of my gym. Why would you even say that? That's stupid, yada, yada. You know, that was my fear that they were just going to instantly be like, well, that's dumb. Why would you do that? So after like two weeks of knowing that I'm going to go do this, I finally get to class one day. I tell him. And they, they all kind of laugh because, again, you know, the, the Bean family, they, help, they all help run the gym. But uh, I looked at my coach, Ed, and, and he just went, you got to have balls the size of, uh, oh, what did he say, balls the size of a, a, a minivan to be able to go out and do that. And at that point, okay. you know, they didn't say anything else other than that because it was just mm -hmm. a real quick conversation. We were going to get to jujitsu or whatever we were doing. And then the next thing, you know, at least the next thing they know, they're like, yeah, you told us about it. And then it wasn't, you know, I didn't want to keep bringing it up because, again, I didn't know how people in the surrounding area, I didn't de need to deal with any negativity on it because I was kind of on a fast track at that point leading up to it of you know i'm i'm doing this no matter what and then finally you know they're like what is this you know they're i'm everyone's i'm on everybody's phone it's on <laughs> tbs on the tv show so it was it was definitely uh super cool and they were accepting of it they all support me i've actually had them come down with me to watch unfortunately they were there when i got injured but they were there to watch and got to experience what everything was about going into that yeah that's cool man that's great that they were supportive and um yeah kind of saw the uh, <laughs> sort of pause that required to do it and, and like we said at the very beginning as well like the idea of just standing there and taking a shot is just sounds like a bad day so to it's me fucking horrendous <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it just, yeah it's true mate you got some fucking balls for doing that because it, well, it's just fucking hor horrible, isn't it? Yeah. And so so prior to kind of like doing the qualifier that you mentioned, I mean, had you ever been in any form of slap fight up to this point? Had you ever like kind of stood there and allowed somebody just to clout you in the face? S not so much in the face. Um, again, this goes back to the cornfield days. Me and my buddies, we would... Uh, we would specifically do like you could only kick you could only kick each other in the legs so we'd just be out there kicking the shit oh, out of each other enough. or we'd play body where you can <laughs> you can only hit each yeah. other in in the torso that kind of stuff so you know it was just we'd never specifically made it to the face but i knew i'd you know between football i've taken hits and knew that i you know i have a pretty hard head you know between all sorts of uh blue collar work where you smack your head off of stuff and most people who probably you know would have got knocked unconscious i'm just kind of sitting there going why why is my head still bleeding you know it's that kind of thing <laughs> i i knew i was able to take a hit but before the actual fight you know or the actual qualifier I, there, there wasn't much m me getting hit directly in the face of that that i knew you know was really going to be uh that was the, really the only thing I guess I'm trying to say that I had to find out. And the only way I was going to find out was to go down there and do the damn thing. Yeah. It's just finding out if you've got a chin or not really, isn't it? <laughs> but, but this is the other thing that like surprised me with slap as well is because I, 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 I box like growing up and stuff and I, I've, I've had a few, a couple of MMA bouts. So I've, I've taken plenty of shots over the years, but I've also been slapped a few times as well, but, but typically by, you know, ex-girlfriends or something. <laughs> so for, when I think about, <laughs> like getting slapped I just think it just stings a little bit I don't know if I would have necessarily associated getting slapped with being knocked unconscious so did, did you know that I know you said you'd seen some like tape um, from like um, Europe and stuff but did you know that 
that people could hit you so hard with slaps? Um, yeah, I would say yes, you know, because there were some of the the more viral videos were usually a real big guy knocking out a little guy. But I think the desensitization of watching that happen, you just know that, hey, it's a possibility, you know? I mean, again, it's not that you're, it's not that you don't know it's coming, but you've seen many a times where someone gets, you know, open palm slap out at the, the gas station, you know, because they were talking shit to somebody and they get knocked down on the ground. And you're like, that was just a slap. That would never knock me down. Well, let me tell <laughs> you what, I can, I can vouch and I know many others who can vouch for it that otherwise, you know, you, the, some, some of those strikes, dude, they hit hard. And if you, if you have the right precision, accuracy, speed and power, to land it cleanly, because that's our biggest thing, is landing it cleanly. You can still put somebody's lights out completely. Yeah, mate. Well, I've seen I've seen enough fights now to to not argue, mate. Because um, some of the knockouts that I've seen in slap are probably some of the most vicious knockouts I've ever seen in any combat sport ever. So, so yeah, I know they can hit hard. Um, this might be a good moment actually, because there's potentially still some people watching this episode right now that go, "What the fuck are these lot talking about? Like, what is slap fighting?" <laughs> Give us, give us a quick, uh, a very quick synopsis of what slap fighting is, and then we'll get into more about power slap and the house and everything in that journey. I say slap fighting itself is, you know, you and your opponent walk up to, at least in, in the league that I'm in, they have a table that rises up, there's cameras on it, it's covered in pads to make sure that it's safe if you do go down onto it. But, uh, you know, a coin gets flipped. Whoever is the winner gets to strike first. Whoever is the loser, unfortunately, gets to receive first. And, you know, that's, that's the beginning of the bout. We have three round and five round fights, five rounds for championship. Um, you know, a, a very attentive rule set on making sure that you're doing it in the proper form, that you're not throwing illegal strikes. Um, but basically, we're going up there just to see, who, again, who's got the biggest balls. And for the ladies, who's, who's got the hardest mitts to go up there and <laughs> catch, you, you know, catch you with one and hopefully put you out if you're the person throwing it. But the, I think the funner part of it is being a person, you, know, you lose the coin toss. You think you're about to crap your pants when you get hit. You get hit and you're still standing there. And then that's the first time you're like, oh, wow. Okay, let's go. It's my turn, you know? So that's that's where I think that it really starts to turn for people once they realize, you know, what's going on. But it's it's um, a very, a very in-depth form of combat that, again, you don't have defense like you would in like you would in Muay Thai, like you would in wrestling or jiu-jitsu where you're moving out of the way. Your defense comes down to, you know, how how strong is your chin? Have you worked, you know, and some of it, I think it just comes down to are you built that way? You know, if you're not built for this shit, you're not going to make it, unfortunately. Yeah. How much how much of an advantage is the first lap? Um, I don't know because I if you look at the stats because I know that power slap has the stats somewhere at least for us but the coin toss it's real close to 50 50 of people who go first winning you know it, it's like 48 52 47 53 it's oh, something really? like that because I think a lot of people it's again mental they get out there and they're so, you know, they're so worried about getting the knockout. They're so worried about them possibly getting hit afterwards if they screw it up. And they're so worried about this is the first time for some people you're walking up on a, on a raised podium in front of hundreds of people with cameras and lights everywhere. And I mean, you can see yourself on like a, an 80 foot screen hanging up on the wall behind your opponent you know if if it's not the activity itself that's enough to make your nerves go um it's everything else surrounding you at that point in time that really could you know shake you out and then by the time you get up there if if you're not able to handle and dance under that pressure then that can really screw you over in all reality but um you know again the stats show it's not so much winning the coin toss i think it goes more to are you built for this and are you able to you know go for multiple rounds mm. and tell us about your very first official bout how did that how did that go 
Uh, yeah, my very first bout at the exhibition stuff, um, I was at heavyweight. You know, I had ate an extra large cheese pizza to be able to make weight because, um, again, this is right as I'm getting into martial arts stuff. I'm still on the heavier side. You know, I've weighed 300 pounds before. So I had Have you? completely wow, okay. gone gone and spiraled out of control and you know i stopped weighing myself at like 272 and i know for a fact i got even bigger so at this point i'm i'm down to like 205 i get the call for the exhibition they need heavyweights i told them i'm not scared i didn't give a shit uh you know i'll go up against anybody i was in in that moment there was a, a lot of other stuff going on i guess that you know really played a factor into me getting into training and fighting and then finding that you know that really opened up the door for me to instead of like we've talked about instead of getting caught up in what i would had done in the past with you know falling onto the bottle or you know picking up some sort of drugs i took how i was feeling at that point in time and pointed it into you know into into power slap so i went in there emotionally explode on top of you know everything else so once once i get the call we get down there i go against the guy who's a pro fighter he's had boxing he's had mma um i think he's done muay thai he's done multiple things he's 245 you know i'm i'm probably 215 in all reality but again i might you know if i could have snuck egg weights in my pockets i would have i didn't care <laughs> but he he gets to go first and you know this dude's hand you know i have an all right size hand for for my build this dude's hand was like this i swear to god <laughs> and i'm like man i'm about to get beat in the head with a catcher's mitt you know i was like if i go down i go down but he hit me with like a, a pillow it was just kind of like boop and i looked at him and then i looked around because everybody was just kind of like what the fuck was that and then I was like, oh, I guess it's my turn. So, you know, I turned around, we lined up, and I fucking cracked him. You know, I cracked him very hard. I didn't knock him out in any of the rounds. Um, there was a big size discrepancy, I guess is the best way I can put that. But also, it was both of our first times doing anything like this. So, you know, we went three rounds. This dude had size advantage in all ways. He had a combat sports advantage in all ways. And I came out victorious, you know, un unanimous decision. Uh, I, I wobbled him a little bit. And, you know, he stepped back. At no point in time did I move away from where I was standing. It was really um, a really tried and true test of them figuring out what power slap could or couldn't do. So, you know, it was the most excitement, I guess, I'd felt in a long time because I get, I get the win. But also, you know, I had no damage. I had no damage whatsoever from this guy because he just wasn't built for it. You know, he not that he doesn't hit hard maybe in his other sports, but he sure as hell didn't hit me hard enough in those ones to do anything. So it was it was wild. And then, you know, that that ends and at that point in time you know there's no commission there's no there we were helping make the rule set at that time pretty much what was going on so, and i win that match again at heavyweight uh the next day i have a new opponent because he won his match i won my match and they were trying you know i told him as soon as i was done i said i want to fight tomorrow and they you know the guy i was talking to he said i don't make those decisions but you know we'll we'll see what we can do i said you can talk to the motherfucker that does i want to fight tomorrow give me my second <laughs> fight and lo and behold i got my wish i've got a dude who's 265 who's a powerhouse now in the heavyweight division uh him and i went three rounds um they haven't shown that fight again that was before the rule set was made so there was a little bit of determining you know how things were going to go in the future off of that one but i unfortunately lost that but we put on a show and we did what we were supposed to and it was a hell of a fight shout out to disturbing the peace dorian um we're buddies to this day and uh it was probably you know again and the, one of the craziest things, the craziest two days that I've ever had in my life to go up there and do this. Like, you know, you've got Dana White sitting in the crowd because after your fight, you're, we're both, we didn't know who had won. Again, this is the second fight. We have no clue who's won yet. The, the referee says, great match. You guys both did well. You're both still standing. You both, you know, slapped the shit out of each other. We're, we're, we're getting our 10 to 15 seconds to yell something at Dana White to call us back because 
at that point, you don't, you know, we don't know what's going on. Uh, Dorian gets the, and, you know, we were, afterwards, it was crazy, because you go up there, you're an absolute psycho, you're an absolute animal, you're, you're ready to, you know, knock, and then as soon as you're done, you're friends again, you know, it was, we were outside the hotel, we're taking <laughs> pictures together, like, whose cheek lives more swelled up, yours or mine, you know, I still have the picture in my phone saved right now, both of us, we got a chipmunk cheek, and we're just hanging out, and we probably went to go get some food afterwards, so, you know, that was really what the qualifier was about, figuring out what, not what we could do ourselves as the competitors, but what Power Slap was going to be able to do in the future. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, I I knew you had a loss on your record, and I don't remember ever seeing you lose, so I did wonder where that was. So that makes sense. And I think the obviously on the show you had, um, I think was it Wolverine, one of the coaches? Didn't he have yes. that ridiculous match where I can't remember how many slaps they went? You, you you'll be able to tell us, I'm sure. But it's like 27 rounds. Yeah, it was fucking well, how insane. How the fuck did they do that? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it was just like a, a knockout only match or something. It was a different organization that is a real smaller one that they can that Darius uh, and Wolverine because that's what the main the main event was going to be leading through the first show. Um, you know, they'll probably forever hold that record. I don't think anyone is ever going to let that happen again. And if they do, I'd be very surprised if they don't get in trouble for it or if someone doesn't die. But. Uh, yeah, they they had that wild match. <laughs> Twenty seven fucking slaps. What was the state of their faces afterwards? Not like mince me, mate. Yeah, I was gonna say they just looked yeah. fucked. They must be made they of steel. They actually had to fit because Wolverine's eye had started to like swell shut. Because I believe there was some, you know, even if there is an illegal strike landed at least in what they were doing in that promotion at that time, they were able to keep going forward as long as you were all right. You got like an extra minute break or something, something along those lines. I'm not too sure, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the Wolverine and Darius really went out there and, you know, before us at Power Slap, they're two of the ones who really carried this over here in America, at least to make it what it is now. Yeah, mate, it was honestly, it was, I think it's on YouTube if you want to watch it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I will. I'll go and watch it because it's that's fucking twenty seven slaps is on. Oh yeah, real. it's it's crazy. I think they were heavyweights as well, right at the time. Yes, at that time they were both competing at he for heavyweight. Yes, yeah, so they're big boys playing yeah. each other. It's fucking incredible how they stayed standing. Yeah, but yeah, it was nuts. And then obviously the the kind of road to the title show that was obviously aired on. I think it was on Rumble in the end. Um, but that was very similar to the Ultimate Fire, wasn't it? In the sense that you obviously. You know, you had the coaches who, as you say, were, were due to be fighting. Uh, you had like two weights, two teams, um, and you all obviously lived in a house together. I mean, when you got through that kind of qualifying round and you knew where you were going into that house, like obviously you had your family at this point. I mean, what were your thoughts about go, leaving your family and, and going into that house? Going into the house, you know... Is exciting because it's an opportunity a lifetime. Because you know, again, they they've decided, hey, hey, we're on TV now. So we knew that our the fruits of our labor from the very first thing where we had all kind of spent a couple months. You know, no one had heard anything yet. We didn't know whether it was going to fall through or not. You know, we we basically were not just building the rule set and building what Power Slap's foundation was going to be. We were the pilot episodes for if they were going to be able to make this into a TV show. So, you know, again, multiple things riding on all of that of what they were going to do with it. But like you said, it was absolutely Ultimate Fighter style. We had, uh, oh... In the house, we had middleweights, light heavyweights, and heavyweights, at least for my episode. So everyone kind of kind of had, you know, some people that they could talk to that they probably weren't going to be fighting. And um, was really more so spread out than the ultimate fighter style when it comes to weight classes. But also, we were spread a lot more thin when it comes to weight cla depth of weight classes. So, mm. you know, I know there's guys that weren't able to guys and girls that weren't able to get um back into it from the qualifier whatever those reasons are lord only knows it could be a million different things from medical or them just not wanting to do it ever again but uh yeah once once we go to leave to go do road to the title season one 
You know, I sat down with my wife and kids, and of course the kids grasp to their age level of what's going on, the magnitude of all of it. And I, all, you know, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gone for almost three weeks. Um, do we think that we can make this happen? You know, are you guys going to be okay with me? Because I, I even talked to them before I went to do the qualifier. Like, you, you know, this, it might be scary for you guys because I'm going to go out there and physically, you know, someone might hurt me. And you can't, you can't be mad at the people that hit me because it's not their fault. You know, we both signed up to do this. So explaining that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, I also at my time, at that time, I had to talk to my job because that was in a half weeks that, you know, give or take that I didn't have time to take off of. So I had to go to my company that I worked for then and get the approval to be gone, you know, without pay for, like I said, it was three, two and a half, three and a half weeks, give or take, because it's all kind of a blur these days. But, you know, again, wife, the wife and kids were like, we support you, you know, we're behind you on this, go for it. So once that, once that was said and done, it was how much training can I get ready while I'm waiting to, you know, go down there and do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember watching you in the house, mate. I mean, you were kind of like fairly quiet at points, but I think you, there, there were a couple of occasions where you got quite emotional. Um, so only talking about the family, mate. So I'm guessing you, when you were in there, it was quite a challenge at points being away from the family. Uh, yes. Yes. You know, I even say that in some of the interviews I did down there, um, you know, emotionally you go through so much just before you even get in the house because I'm getting on a plane, you know, early in the morning. I don't get to kiss my children goodbye because it's so early. You know, I get to tell my wife goodbye at least, but, you know, the kids goodbye the night before. You're on a plane. I'm, you know, first time, first time my wife and I have been apart other than the qualifier. You know, that was, that was a week. I could talk to them every day because I had my phone. Um, check in see how things were doing in between stuff but when it came to do the show you get down there you know they take your phone like the day before you go in the house so all you have is the hotel phone we were doing it old school where everyone's writing down numbers you know people that were going in the house were calling each other from hotel to hotel room like they just took my phone and I don't want to talk to somebody and I have no one to talk to so you know that was even before you got in the house the mental games were already starting with uh, you know not being able to communicate with folks so um, you know leaving you know, not just me but everyone who left their family or their loved ones back home to go down there and do that it, it wore on you it was especially with time you know by the end of it people were ready to fucking kill each other just to get that house it was definitely you know not only the mental aspect of competition but the mental aspect and like dana white always likes to say that pressure cooker we were all put in to see who was going to make it and who was going to rise to the top and who was going to fall off yeah mate and i think you know martial artists well fighters tend to be a little bit unhinged at times in a way and obviously, there's been uh, so many seasons of the Ultimate Fighter now, and you've seen some absolute nutters in there. A, a load of slap fighters, I feel, would probably be even worse. And obviously, <laughs> there were there were some absolute characters in your group as well in the house. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there was the there was the dude that you fought, wasn't it? Was it Azil who just kept getting a fucking yes. wanker drunk? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, what, do, what in the house just getting getting yeah. pissed up, and and you never know watching watching the show how much of the how much it's kind of altered for for sort of production and and viewership value. But how bad was that dude's drinking in the house? Was it as bad as they made out? Um, yes and no, you know. And I have to start with saying shout out to Azael. Um, that dude's a, a fucking animal. But he was, you know, and he, to my knowledge and from talking to him in the past and hearing his interviews, he really learned a lot from having to deal with all that. So, you know, that was, I couldn't imagine having that stuff for myself put out on Front Street on, you know, national television for people to be able to pick apart. So, you know, he, he definitely went through some shit because of it and has grown from it. So, you know, I'm glad to see that. But, at the, you know, in the house... It's, and it wasn't just him. It was more so the fact that he was the one making the, you know, a lot of that stuff was in the first three days of us being in the house. Was it? Okay. So he, he was, he really, he was going ham and he was having fun and no one could really blame him for that, but he would go 
and just all of a sudden be zero to 60 having a conversation joking around with somebody the next thing you know he's trying to throw hands in there he's getting (laughs) he's getting choked out and drugged through the house by people and it was just you know the the liquor had really taken over at that point but also we were in a house where beers beers non-stop on demand and the howler head shout out to howler head you know, drink any, and we, I can obviously, you know, uh, tell you why. But the howler had, they would empty a bottle, and sure as shit, you'd turn around, there'd be another one sitting there. Like, they were they were getting past me, and I was completely sober. So I could only imagine how the guys who were gl- drinking it down like water, they'd turn around in a new bottle and just go to town. So... You know, he wasn't the only one that had some some drunken mishaps, but unfortunately for that period of time, he was the only one that was really, you know, focused the camera on for it. But again, he's grown a lot since then, and and I'm really proud of him to, you know, not only as a competitor, because the dude hits like a sledgehammer, I can tell you, for multiple occasions. (laughs) He, He made it through that and is able to, you know, boost his career to where he's at now. Yeah, that's cool, man. Have, have you watched any of it, mate, or not? No, no, I've, okay. I've watched the the all, all the shows now. You've watched the highlights, yeah. No, no, I watched the show. So I watched because yeah. because uh, John was coming on, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember watching that, um, and obviously not really having like a view or an opinion of any of the athletes at that point because I was watching it as it was coming out. I was following it, um, you know, at the time of release, and yeah, he, he seemed like quite a nice kid off, you know, sort of when he was sober. But yeah, he had a drink and then the narrative that the show painted was that he was obviously just being a bit of a nuisance and was quite disliked by some of the other athletes. But then he just kept knocking people out and winning fights. So <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he, well, he got to the final with John. So um, so yeah, he, he was he was good. But I think there was another guy that actually got kicked out of the house, wasn't there? Um, and I think Dana obviously mentioned it, but they didn't actually show any of the reasons why. I mean, what happened with that dude? I assume he um, got a bit too bit too carried away the reduction team right yes that to my if it's because i gotta think here because there was also a guy who took off and ran out of the house and got in trouble and i that was at the very end i have to refresh my memory the one i'm thinking of would have been like the heavyweight that got kicked out of the house that's him yeah 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 so um you know that guy was on the ultimate fighter show in the past but uh, from from my understanding, you know, he he was having a rough time in general dealing with you know whatever was going on in his life. I don't, I can't say that I know he was on drugs, but you had a bit of an inkling that he was coming off of it, and he definitely, you know, he liked to drink. So the first three days, he made it all right, and then from my understanding, because I wasn't in the area when it happened, you know, there might have been some things said that were extremely inappropriate and should have never been said and you know direction got turned towards the staff you know the camera crew themselves and it became a very big issue as to where you know he was taken out of the house and we never saw him again and you know good riddance to you if if you're going to be a scumbag and say things about whether it's how people look uh, the color on people's skin or you know anything right. like that that's not just talking shit for a fight then you don't belong there and we sure as hell don't want you there yeah sorry enough for that yeah and uh, you made me laugh actually because i think it was when um as i was i think maybe the first incident and uh, obviously people were trying to get involved and break it up and i think there was a scene of you just stood basically at like the the bar thing and you were like just let it happen just let it happen <laughs> and then it's done <laughs> so almost felt like you were enjoying the show to some extent it, it definitely got to that point after you know i i was in what they called the old man so it was me Vern, kathy and uh devin we were all you know they were age-wise a little bit older me so more i don't know, I, I go to bed early and I, I always got up early for work purposes obviously so you know we'd be the first ones to usually go to bed and we'd get woken up all the time by by these you know this ruckus going on so usually you know you would wake us up and myself and Vern would be the first ones out there because Devin had to crawl off the top bunk but we'd be like what the fuck is going on you know Vern had an altercation with Azael where he ripped his shirt off basically because he had grabbed him by the shirt and like started to pick him up and the staff split them up and Vern just didn't let go and the shirt came with him while Azael got taken away. You know, it was it was moments like that where 
we were all just kind of driven crazy because we kept getting woken up. You're constantly trying to break fights up because what people don't think about, like, yes, does that make good TV? Absolutely. We have a, 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 a physical contact sport that we are supposed to be doing within a couple of days. So if you get into a while you're in the house and someone splits your wig open or breaks your jaw or knocks your teeth out or breaks your nose and you can't get cleared to compete, you're not going to need for a fight, man. Like that's, you know, all of us are there to make money to fight. And it happens. The next thing you know, not only do the guy getting beat up has to deal with everything that happened to him. Now you're out of fight because the supposed to fight just got into an altercation in the house so that was you know there was a point in time where uh new 170 champ uh emmanuel muniz shout out to him he was at middleweight in the house at the beginning when we were still getting everything kind of figured out struck why i yelled up and carried him away and just kept saying not my check not my check he's carrying him off to the back and be like <laughs> dude you need to, you're drunk it's fine just lay down and go to bed because i'm not getting screwed out of my fight so it was, you know, a bunch of stuff like that that just get, drives you to the point where, you know, I'm eating a sandwich, drinking my my protein shake, going, just let them fucking fight and get it over with because <laughs> the security guards were, like, waiting at the bottom of the stairs or waiting outside the door because as soon as it would pop off, security, boom, in there, the staff coming in, telling whoever, like, you, we've already given you or you or you multiple chances. If you're going to fuck this up for yourself, you need to stop now. So... You know, it, it really pushed everybody again, that pressure cooker environment you're put in. I, I don't know how many pounds of pressure was in that cooker, but I tell you what, it was more than it was probably able to supposed to be able to hold. Yeah, I bet. And you say about like getting get injured, mate. There was um, there was a little scrap that I think was it Chris and um, I think that was his name and Slap Jesus when those guys had a yep. little bit of a scrap. And uh, I think they, they got into a clinch and I think, I think it was Slap Jesus picked him up and, and like took him down but as he did that I was watching and I was like oh because his head oh. missed this like cabinet by literally like this much and I'm yes. like, if he cracked his not off that the way he took him down he probably would have put him in a fucking coma let alone really? just off the show yeah yeah that 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 I can remember that specifically watching it happen as well because I was on the other side of the house going don't fucking do that like you said as soon as he was up in the air I'm like he's about to get dumped on his head and like you said, that that cabinet or whatever was right there was it was solid. So had he hit it, you know, he could have very well screwed him up, not just for competition wise, but for life, depending on how you landed on it. So, I'll tell you again, what, I it was a very a risky show. business. <laughs> yeah, honestly, mate. The no, I'm gonna go watch house. it. Honestly, I've got nothing on tonight, so yeah. I think I'm just gonna go home and stick it on. <laughs> yeah, mate, it was, it was fucking mental, and it was and. I mean, was there anybody that you just really disliked and avoided, like, in the house? Or did you typically get on okay with most people? Um, I got along with most everybody. I, I kind of had to make myself, again, I had to make myself have a problem with Azael. Not because we actually had a problem in the house, but it was more so we were towards the end. I knew it was me and him, you know our last fights were going to be probably for whoever was going to get a shot at the title. So, you know, at that point I had to mentally prepare myself that that's probably the guy that I'm going to be going against. And, you know, I could, if you, if you blink at me funny, you know, I wanted to be petty. I could use that as motivation for a fight, you know? So it was, it wasn't so much anything he actually did to me, but you know, when it comes to actually having problems with anybody in the house, not really, no, you know, if, if, if there's an issue or you're too, you know, too much, too much for me to really deal with, I just kind of try and avoid the situation at all costs and kind of leave it, leave it how it is. I could give two shits and a fuck less in all reality. I am worried about what I got going on and what I need to do, not whatever, whatever business you're yeah, getting into. Yeah, it just into. comes with maturity, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I so. Get, I should get older, you just think, oh, fuck off. And I think when enough. you're not, when yeah, you're not pissed much. up, when you're not drinking, you can yeah. typically make much better yeah, decisions, yeah, yeah, can't you? Yeah. And of course, mate, for you as well, you knew you had like, you know, that the family back home as well, kind of, you know, missing you, waiting for you to come home with that belt. So that's obviously added motivation to to keep it together as well, right? How much does the the weight of like being in the house have like, when, you, when you're thinking about, I can't do anything stupid because of the reaction from the public or, you know, how much does that have a bearing on what you, how you act? Definitely played a factor because, um, 
I relate it to, at least for me, being able to, to get through it. It reminded me a lot of boot camp because you have to follow these rule sets. You have to be here at this time when you're told to be there at this time. So following direct instruction for me was easy. That wasn't too much of, of a hassle. But getting used to the cameras and, and not knowing, you know, you don't know what edits they're going to put out there. They obviously, like you, you were saying a minute ago, Paul, you can tell, you know, they used all of that against Azael to make him look that way on the show. They took, you know, my emotional parts of them asking about my family and me being overwhelmed with all of that and use that as my part in the show. And, and they did that, you know, with multiple different characteristics of folks throughout the show um, to really put a... You know, not so much a label for what, you know, what they wanted you to be, but just more so your storyline that they were running with through the show. But it, it definitely plays business. a factor because I remember the one guy was like, you know, there was an altercation in the house so verbal of people just popping off some crazy shit and you know the one guy he was ready to go home he was like i got a family at home i don't need people saying that shit about me i don't need people telling my kids that this is what was said about me on tv you know he was he was ready to leave and I, you know was out the door for probably a day because they, they are to drive him around so he could cool off because they knew like hey we need you here so they're gonna do everything they can to get you to stay but it you know it it played more facts time went on because the reality really started to sink in that like when you get up at 5 a.m and the camera guy's like right here you're like oh wow <laughs> we really on camera all the time you know there was the first week i probably kept them on their toes the most but it was more so because they'd wake up in the morning and they'd be like what is that noise you know it's 5 a.m. It's me just going to the bathroom and getting my day ready. So they'd come in and be like, we thought something was wrong with the mic. We didn't know you were up already because they'd have to change the batteries on your mic pack. So, you know, I've never been in another situation where you you would wake up and then someone's standing over you because you fell asleep with your mic pack on and they're putting new batteries in it and trying to put it back into your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fucking like, terrible. That is funny, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, big brother, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Big brother. Yeah, yeah. We've got a bunch of nutties. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, let's get a bit more into the actual sport itself then because, again, it's a fascinating sport. And I know the UFC, as they do, obviously want to try and, you know, elevate it as much as possible. And obviously, the, I think that the, the trend of, of the viewing on like online was fucking massive. So it, it just exploded, didn't it? And, uh, you know, I, Danny and I are sort of fitness trainers and, you know, I, I've done a sort of sports science degree. So I'm I'm quite interested in like, you know, physical attributes of different sports. And I know the UFC spent quite a lot of time analyzing you guys in regard to, you know, your talk, your slap, your neck strength, trying to understand like, what physical attributes are required to be effective at this sport. So for somebody who'd come from obviously, you know, doing a bit of martial arts and, and playing a few sports and training and then trying to prepare yourself to the best of your ability for this sport, like how did, how was that? How was that kind of the, the sport science stuff where they were taking you through that training? How, what was that like? Can you explain? It was really cool, again, you know, being the first to do a lot of this stuff to, again, determine how things are going to go in the future. Um, they, we basically had a mini combine. They, they tested your grip strength. They tested uh, rotation, how far you can move on um, both sides, what your wingspan is. Um, again, the, the cube to see, you know, however those measurements come out to see what number of power you're going to get from hitting that cube and it's crazy how much power people can produce with the slap you know just a slap up on that pack you see guys throw punches and they get lower numbers than some of us and you're like how the fuck do you even you know it doesn't it doesn't correlate but uh it's again it's its own its own beast that has really become you know what it is now but it was a super fun they we did uh I'm trying to think what else we did while we were down there Oh, so you, they have a mechanism that you push with your neck. You know, you push on one side, take a break, you push again. Um, I believe you did three pushes on the left side and on the right side. So that way they can take all the numbers, find the average and kind of figure out what your neck strength is. And they did the same thing where you'd put your hand on it and you'd push to see how much pressure just pushing with your shoulder to get the average for that. So it was new stuff like that that... 
I mean, I guarantee none of us had ever done anything like that before. So you're not only is, you know, the UFC staff learning and trying to figure it out, you're learning, trying to figure it out. And what is the best way to, you know, afterwards be able to train to make all of those attributes better? Did, I, did anyone have like a ridiculously good score and then wasn't? like at the top, you know what I mean? Like did those, did those results like correlate to where you were, the champions were the best at those schools or was it just completely random? Um, I guess it, it really kind of depends. You know, I think for the most part, everyone who's at the top has a good score in, in one or the other. Um, but it hasn't really been like this person had the best scores all the way through and they're at the top. You know, there's guys who landed harder hits there's people, even um, of a Sheena Bathory, I'm sure you are probably the the Hungarian Hurricane. You might be familiar with her from she coached on the show. And if yeah, not, yeah. you can see these uh, out and about. But, uh, you know, her next strength was through the roof. She beat everybody in all seriousness. She was just built different. Again, that, you're going to hear us say that a lot from Power Slap. She was just absolutely built different. But, uh, you know, no one who had the greatest everywhere was able to come out on top, I think. But it's so, you know, it was so new. I haven't hit that um, that meter, uh, that, that cube to see, you know, since then, if I have more power, if I have less power, whatever, whatever it could be, you know. Um, it was more so at that point in time, they tested it, and that's kind of where it's sitting at, so... I know uh, Ryan Phillips had like the biggest, uh, the highest number for hitting the cube. You know, he he beat Brian Shaw, the one of the world's strongest man, by a couple thousand, like six thousand points or something. Which Brian's I heard Brian a Shaw. Big boy. Yeah, he was talking about it the other day, and he's like, with no form, yada yada, dude. I don't care whether you have form or not. You probably weren't gonna hit it that hard, whether you're the strongest man in the world or not, because you don't have any knowledge on our sport. Whether he thinks it's a sport or not, he can piss off if he doesn't. Don't care. Um, <laughs> I just, I just was one of those things where people could say that you're not an, an athlete because you're the world's strongest man, but I fully believe he's an athlete, and I know that we are all athletes, but differing opinions cause good conversation so maybe he'll maybe he'll hear it and want to have a little chat whatever yeah, um, <laughs> okay. yeah i'm sure you just slap the jaw off him mate you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> so we still don't know what the like the we still don't know what the best the, the most valuable attribute in a slap athlete is yet then no not so we could have one at least not to my knowledge like, what would it be <sighs> you know i i power you know if you have the power but you know, to see that here's the problem is me personally, you know, I think so much about all of it. You can have the power, but if your technique's not perfect, the power means nothing. If you're if your accuracy is off, that power means nothing because you're you're slapping, you're slapping someone in the orbital where you're not supposed to. You're missing in karate where you're in the carotid where you're not supposed to. So you know you can have all the power in the world, but if you have accuracy. It's going to screw you over. And, and if you're accurate with your hand and you have a little bit of power, but you can't keep your feet planted, you know, you're going to get constant penalties if this has happened in the past. So if I swing, knock you out, but my foot, my, my foot comes up off the ground too hot, you know, more than just like this much. Because of momentum, they give you a little bit of leeway. It's the same as how, you know, for flinching, you're allowed to clinch a very small movement but once you start moving or start doing stuff you know into it or away from it that's when the penalties begin so all of that plays a factor in this and that's why i think it was hard to find one specific attribute for anybody to have that was going to mean hey you know they were dominant it's not like back in the day when you know when ufc first started you don't, there was no one who came in and was like, oh, my grappling background is going to get me to the top of this. There, there was no Gracie's for us. There was no, you know, uh, Dan Severons coming in who had a great wrestling background to hold you down and ground and pound. We didn't have uh, a Don Fry that was just an absolute animal with his feet that could go to the ground if he wanted, but wanted to stand. Um, 
for us, it was it's all of that combined together. I was just talking to someone that you know uh, is tr- tr- about training the other day. You you need perfect combination of your technique, accuracy, the speed and power because obviously those are more so correlated with one another than the others. But again, the technique, the speed and power, the accuracy. Once you've got that, at least from the offensive standpoint. You have to do the rest. It's the same as finding out, you know, do you have a good job? Are you more, you know, are you going to do better in Southpaw as, as you're first getting into anything combat sports wise? It's really, you know, the melting pot of putting it all together to be the best power slap or slap fighter, I, I guess, is what that really comes down to. So that's why I think the range of tests that we went through was so wide and open. Because people were like, what are we even doing this for? And it's like, you, because if not, we're never going to find out. We're not going to know, you know, what it takes to be the best other than, hey, I'm the champion now. I know what I've done, but that might not work for somebody else because of your build, you know, height discrepancies. Um, you know, weight cut plays a factor in all of that. And now the same as it does for, for regular fighters. So, Mm. Yeah, you know, I wish I could really find one specific attribute, but I can't say that I can. It's definitely being being well-rounded in a multitude of things and then finding what works best for you to translate into power slap because I you know, I power lifted for a few years. That was something that I had really got into. Again, you know, that was before I met my wife and when I was kind of really getting into uh working out and trying to be on the healthier side. So I you know I tried to use powerlifting to the best of my ability to help me, you know, what with what I was gonna be doing in power slap. Because you know, with a deadlift you have to make sure your feet are planted into the ground. You want your feet to have roots the earth and feel that that's the exact same thing you need to do when it comes to your stance when you're about to throw a strike know that no matter what when you throw that strike from one side all the way through to the other that your feet aren't going to move because once those start moving then everything else you're doing doesn't matter because now you've committed a penalty and now you're really going to lose because you know uh it's not like MMA and boxing where, well, you're down one point, you've got seven more rounds to go, or one point, you've got to win the next round, and this round for sure to get the win. You're down a point, and you're fucked, is what it is. So you're either going to knock the guy or your opponent out, or you're not going to, because that one mistake in the first round is going to carry over to the very end. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, as you say, it's still a very young sport isn't it so it's fascinating i know obviously static would tell you that the biggest attribute is being in the mosh pit right and just get a head yeah. from head banging <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh when he said that his his tune has changed over time um i know he's definitely working out more now but that was a lot of people's thing you know that's that was his storyline that they were going to run with about coming off the couch and not having that much training in this so you know not not that him not training as much beforehand has to do with any of his losses, but I know now he is training more. And for him, when he does come back, is going to be, you know, he had the great capabilities beforehand. And now that he's focusing all of that and putting it together, and he's going to make himself to, you know, be that real well-rounded fighter all the way around and work his way back to, you know, what I'm sure like everybody else wants, he wants another title shot. Yeah, 100%. And then, obviously, in the house you had, I think, was it two fights you had actually in the house on the show from memory? Is that yes. right? And then the final, is that is that how it worked? Yeah. You got that for that sort of first fight out of the way and obviously got the win. How did that feel? It felt good to get the win because uh, that was my fight against John Kennedy. And I, again, this is a perfect example of what I was just talking about. My first strike, uh, uh, I clubbed him a little bit, I believe, and I I point. You know, and in that moment in time, you know, it is what it is. It's first fight, getting the jitters out. But by the third round, you know, I'm down. I'm down that point. He's winning. um, He landed a clean strike in the first round, landed a club. I'm down that round. Second round, he hit me with a good shot. You know, nothing illegal that they called. And then I landed a clean shot. I'm still down because of that first round. So the third round. 
I have no choice that I have to get a knockout or a stoppage. I'm probably going to lose. And at that point, no one knew, you know, what losing meant for the show. We thought lose and then, you know, get shuffled around. Um, me, I hit him with a good one, dropped him. He wobbled around the the uh, podium and the and the platform, and they stopped it. And I got, I got the stoppage. So that felt great. That part felt amazing. Um, you know, I was super excited to get the win. Knew that I was going to do adv advance forward. But later on, once we get home, and they're like, "Hey, you know, the people who lost, y'all are going to get sent home now." It was like, "Oh wow," you know the. I guess the the weight of what could have happened didn't really hit me until that point because now I realize that had I not been able to come away with that in the third round at the end of that fight, I'd be on my way home. And, you know, that could have been the first step of me never being able to have this conversation with you gentlemen, of me never getting a title shot, of me, you know, so the the magnitude of all of that really started to hit me because then on top of it, now I realize I've just sent someone home who was there at the qualifier at the beginning of this, who, you know, had the same hopes and dreams as the rest of us to really be able to take this and build it and be part of it into what it is today. So, you know, again, not having those those minor issues that cause penalty are the biggest factor and i think that that was the moment i realized you you know don't let it go to the judge's decision if you can and if it does go to their decision you better hope that you made them do thing where they wobble more they almost fall over they have you know the reaction Actions of boxing and MMA when someone gets hit with a good one and you see him do the oh yeah I'm good I'm good no you're not good that fucking hurt and we know it hurt we all know it hurt mm -hmm. so you know having those scenarios for the judges to read off of that stuff to be able to make sure they can come away with a unanimous decision is is really the weight of all of it that needed to be done yeah so then I guess going into then the next match that might have felt a bit different than her because you now knew the gravity of the situation, perhaps. Uh, yes. You know, I, I knew at least and thought that um, I was possibly looking at a title shot and, and hopefully going to get there. But with the next match, I didn't, I didn't want there to be any discrepancies. I didn't want to leave anything on the table of what if, you know, what if you hadn't done this? What if there hadn't been that? I didn't want any of that. I wanted to come away with the cleanest win possible, whether it was by knockout or unanimous decision. You know, I don't even like getting a split decision. I don't want that to be an option. I want none of those judges in their mind to think, hey, the other guy might have won that one. Yeah, and it's interesting what you say about the, the fouling because I do remember watching it and there seemed to be a lot of that where you could tell the guys, obviously, because it was, a, again, a relatively new sport, a lot of the guys were lacking a little bit of technique and precision with their shots. Um, so, yeah, you do see a little bit of that. And then you obviously finished the show and then obviously there was the finale. So was there a bit of... How long was the gap between finishing the show and then actually doing the finale or was it part of the show? I can't quite remember. So we got done because it was right before Thanksgiving when we got done with the filming in the house. And then March 11th was actually the one year anniversary of the first power slap when we got to go up there and uh, compete for the first titles to be given out. So from the end of November to the very beginning of, so, uh, you know, three months ish, give or take, is what it was to find and you know, get out of the house and then and wait for when the event was going to be announced. And then what was your training like during that period? What sort of stuff would you typically do for your training? Um, you know, real, real heavy shrugs because, uh, you know, building up here so that way you're able to take the hit and kind of keep everything as stable as possible for me the iron neck thing that they have that you put on your head and you move around for mobility yeah, one, yeah. you get into the jaws or size stuff um i like running because what people may not think of so i would and then i would come in and practice my strikes because the adrenaline's already up 
you're worn out a little bit so that way when you are going to compete you know you should be feeling better you know you i i want to make it as much of a real life simulation as possible so i would get done with my run come in practice my strikes you know throw throw a hundred strikes a day try and make sure i'm landing on the exact same spot every time um, you know, shoulder strengthening and mobility stuff, because I think functional strength for this is, is a big factor for a lot of people. You know, if you can deadlift 400 pounds, that's great. You've got good grip strength. You, you know, you've got that base for your feet, but if that's all you're really doing is banging heavy weight, I don't think that it's all going to correlate into what you need. You know, you're, you're going to have mobility issues at that point, I think, cause you'll end up being too stiff and you know maybe too tight so again finding the the perfect balance for all of that you know was a factor that kind of if some stuff felt like it was working great if it didn't then i had to you know kind of reassess um a lot of core work for the movement stuff for the the side to side movement and making sure that uh you know, you don't injure yourself because that's a big thing. You know, obviously I have my own injuries to deal with, but you would, you could easily hurt your wrist and your elbow, um, you know, if you hit something and you didn't have your arm set right. So uh, again, a lot of it was just getting the repetitions in, knowing where your body needs to be and, you know, uh, making sure that you're prepared as possible to go up there um, and, and are able to compete again. Yeah, so it's quite diverse training, mate. But yeah, I think it sounds like you're covering the sort of key things, the strength, rotational stuff, um, obviously the next strength as well. And then sort of three months on, you obviously had the title fight. How did that go? You know, probably my best fight to date against Sal for that for the title fight. He it's a good one. Um, I was able to eat it come back and you know give him give him a one and done he you know knocked him out he sat off the table and sat back down i think the table actually woke him back up you know i know <laughs> you know if, if you're watching you're this right, as right, a, I, I know you're i know you're so tired of hearing that but unfortunately <laughs> it happened but um <clears throat> you know i i thought honestly that they were going to let him continue um up in you know stumbled into the referee on the other side of the platform so once i got got the okay that they were calling i i absolutely lost my shit i didn't even know what to say anymore i was just screaming random vanity pretty much at the crowd because i you know i i couldn't believe what just happened let alone you know understand the magnitude of being the very first middleweight champion of power slap coming out creating one of the most viral knockouts that they had in the beginning and you know just being able to celebrate because there was there was a lot riding on that you know i didn't know if i'd ever be able to get a title shot if i didn't win um again there was a lot of stuff going on in the background family wise you know before i had got even in before i had even discovered power slap you know the whole COVID stuff happened and i lost quite a bit of family members on that side so there was a lot of pent up uh emotion and aggression that i had in there that finally was able to come out you know i was able to bring my aunt and my brother-in-law they flew out down there and i was able to get them in into the to come and watch me so you know just knowing that the family members i had lost that were never going to be able to was able to create something that was going to be an unforgettable experience not just for me but for one that i you know was a part of it for that that specific event yeah mate, it was it was an awesome knockout and as you say the way the way he bounced off the podium as well just um yeah just made it even better i think to watch and how has that changed your life since being the champion what was that kind of those first initial months? What were they like? Uh, nothing crazy. It's not like I can't go to the store, you know, media pounding down my door or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, Give social time, media mate. started to, yeah, <laughs> yeah, hopefully. They can come knocking now, you know, y'all got uh, sponsorship, <laughs> boom. But, uh, you know, it was, it, it was, so, you know, social media picked up. I had had maybe 200 followers and it it was people who I'd gone to school with, people that I, you know, was friends with. Uh, I'm almost making three thousand right now, which may not be a big number, but from where I come from, that's that's a huge number. I I have no reason as to why anybody would really want to follow me on any social media platform, but you know, it it picked up right 
way you're getting messages from getting messages from people that you never expected i i got a lot more love than than hate i would say you know of course there was always some when you're not athletes, you guys are this, this is stupid, yada, yada, whatever. Take your opinion and stick it where the sun don't shine. But, you know, I've had people from other countries and uh, people that I never thought I'd even talk to again that, you know, from years, years ago that I didn't even think they'd remember me. They were like, hey, man, your story's inspirational. You made me want to get up and start chasing my dreams and doing my own thing. And, you know, finding out that I, you know, it's not that it's a superpower, but you have the ability to maybe change someone else's life who has gone through similar stuff that I have, who's dealt with, you know, anything that we've talked about today, whether it's mental health stuff, whether it's addiction stuff, whether it's the blue collar life, because, you know, people need to realize just because you're a blue collar person and you work that hard ass job, there's a lot of other shit that goes into that. You know, you have to deal with a lot. So being able to represent the people where I come from and, you know, make a connection with folks around the world, you know, India loves this stuff. I've had, you know, people from India, I'm trying to, we're trying to decipher what one another is saying, but it all comes down to, you know, they're a fan and I'm grateful for them to be a fan. So it's, you know, a life changing experience just in that, not only including, you know, being able to take the family to do stuff when, you know, when I make enough money, that's extra coming from Power Slap. We're able to, to do stuff here at the house. We're able to, you know, go out and do things more, you know, in all seriousness, after that show, um, my wife and I decided to have another baby. So that's why the youngest one in the house right now pretty much got, <laughs> that's part of why he's here was us going and, you know, making that decision as a family and me going out there and, and doing this. So it, it changed my life in a multitude of ways, not just for me, not just for I know, but for my family also. Yeah. Brilliant, man. Congratulations on that's the, uh, on the new baby. Yeah. And obviously the, the kind of the journey didn't really end there, though, did it? Because you're, you've had a couple of fights since, and obviously your first title defense against Wes had a bit of uh, wasn't smooth sailing, should we say? And I, I, I remember watching that, and I didn't know the result before I watched it. So I was kind of, I wasn't watching it live, I don't think, but I was watching it, you know, as good as. And yeah, tell us what happened with your very first strike. Um, you know, this going against Wes Rain, that was him and I had. Uh, a little shadowing to that fight that makes it even more, you know, upsetting how things went. He had a battle in the house because him and I, you know, from the qualifier to the house, him and I were like, it's probably going to be me and you for the title. You know, we, we were thinking we were going to be the very first ones. You know, we had the, the ranking advantage. We had been there since the very beginning of this. So, you know, we were basically paying that in our minds before it started so not having him be my very first opponent um i think it made him a little bit which by all rights but i think it was more so he he wanted to do that not just for himself but because him and i both knew that it was going to be absolutely all out you know balls to the walls kind of thing friendship set aside because when you get up to that table we don't give a shit who's on the other side you want what i have or you're trying to take what i've got or you're trying to keep food from my family's mouth that's the mentality that most of us carry but um you know good one i was able again to to make it through that first one and then i threw my first strike and you know to the to date that's probably the hardest strike that he's ever eaten i don't know if he would say that anymore <laughs> i haven't talked to him recently but it's probably the only one where he's had to lean up on the table with both hands and hold himself up but in the process of that um my shoulder went out of place as i hit him um that right there is a perfect prime example of chasing the knockout and you know i not that it was anything that could have been prevented i'd say but it was more so uh, i just wanted to knock him out and get it over with compared to you know pay attention to what i needed to to go in those rounds so you know the shoulder goes out i get it back. i you know now now i'm thinking you know i lost my marine corps career because of my left shoulder so in that second, I'm thinking I'm about to lose all of my power slap career because of my 
shoulder. So I'm mentally, I'm fucking gone. I'm in so much pain. You know, my heart, it's, it's screaming eagle shit coming out of my shoulder. You know, I don't know what the f my arm. I don't know if they're going to stop it. Luckily, I had trained with my left hand. And since that shoulder is one that I've already had surgery worked on in the past, I knew my shoulder would be okay. But when it to putting in the work and technique with the left hand, you know, it wasn't exactly I needed it to be, but it was good enough to where I was like, I'm not giving up right now because I have now I have to convince the doctor that I'm okay. And convince the referee that I'm okay, and I have to look at Dana White, Frank, Hunter, um, Erica, the, the matchmaker, all of them down at the table. I have to tell them that I'm going to be okay because this is round one of a five round. I have to convince them, all of them, okay, and that I can go with my left hand. So, uh, you know, we we're it past that, we go do it. But now, you know, physically, we can do it, but mentally, that was the worst thing that could have ever happened, especially up there, because my focus is gone. I'm in thriving, thriving fucking pain coming out of my arm. You know, my mentality of, of focus, of being able to take a strike is gone because there was some, you know, again, the rule set is so new. There was a flinching penalty that I got. They were having uh, an issue with think of figuring out whether or not I was flinching in that. And uh, he, he actually did get to hit me twice for one of those. So he landed six strikes that whole fight. And it was only a five-round <laughs> fight. Um, Fucking hell. You know, and I, I guess the frustration built more as the fight went on. Because I know I'm capable with my left hand of hitting him with a good one. But because I was so worried about landing a clean strike, you know, not getting an, an, an injury, not getting a penalty. I was like three inches far away. And I, I just, but that being said, because he was. You know, this is my interpretation of it from his side. I don't know what he would say, but because he knew I was wounded and he knew that, you know, he, he had out capabilities, he was chasing the out. So he got like three fouls out of a five round fight. So three out of the six strikes he threw were illegal. That cost him three points. You know, when it comes to the flinching stuff that they're trying to figure out with what well, that was on my end, I say the the one that they called a flinch is a flinch. They called it a flinch. Other than that, I don't care what anybody has to say. I'm up there, and the hardest thing is to focus and keep my shit together because I um, once the strikes started and illegal or that were really good because I mean he hits like a hammer. I'll give him that wholeheartedly. Again, I'm. I'm convincing the referee. I'm convincing the doctor that I can continue because if they stop this and, you know, it goes to him, everything that I've just worked for and built to get to this point is completely gone. And I have to start over not only losing the belt, I have to start over with a fucking injury that I don't know what the magnitude is yet. So a, a lot of, you know, mental in that fight was completely gone. I was all over the place. And then finally, you know, we get to the final round. I have one strike left to throw. All it has to do is be a clean one because of the penalties. And you know, after convincing both sides that we were able to go, um, there was a drunk guy in the crowd. Of course, leave it to this. There's a drunk guy in the crowd. He's a leopard print coat on. And this just goes to show, you you know, the CTE hasn't kicked in yet. Fucking poosh. Um, he's... He's got his beer in the air and he's going, throw the right, throw the right. And of course, as, as a, a hillbilly cornbread fed motherfucker that I am, uh, a, a classic hold your beer moment was right there for the right for the picking. And I, you know, right on three, the crowd goes, oh, he's going to throw the right again, you know. I didn't know if I was going to completely rip my arm out of socket or not, but I was so mentally uh, defeated on my side because the left wasn't delivering what I wanted it to. I'm having to deal with all these other obstacles. I was just so pissed off that I was like, fuck it. And I find, you know, I throw the right hand. I get a penalty because I stepped. 
So now, <laughs> because of my, you know, my ignorance and the drunk guy in the crowd who I listened to, instead of doing what I knew I should have, um, you know, I get a penalty. So that fight is all over the place because now you've got these on both sides of all all and sizes you've got convincing you know refs and doctors that we can keep going and you know once i threw that strike i cut you know get my point taken i don't know if i've lost because you know i've just taken six hits head uh i'm i'm lost in how i feel because you know mentally i did because i'm hurt so i don't know you know i don't know what's going to happen and as soon as as soon as Dana White walks up there before they call the decision, he goes, "You were up. Fuck! Did you throw your right hand again?" And I just looked at him and went, "I don't know." So you know that was like, oh man. And at that point, I'm thinking, oh man, I really fucked up. I really made a, a big a big mistake doing because when Dana's like, "What the fuck were you thinking, man?" You know, I'm I'm shitting bricks. And then, you know, we, we've we got our hands uh, in the referees, and I'm just, you know, not, not a, I'm the a most super religious person, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm reaching out to all the family members on the other side and any sort of powers of the universe that may be. I'm like, just give me the win. Just give me the win so I can prove this is not the competitor I am. These are not the fights that, that, you know, Wesley and I wanted to put on. These are not the fights that any want to happen. You know, I'll, I'll take the weight of dealing with all the penalties. You know, that helps us grow in the long run when it comes to power slap. But once they finally raised my hand in the air, man, I, I probably could have chance and I wouldn't have cared because I was just so happy that I, I came out on top now my next goal is to you know rehabilitate and figure out what I can do with my with my arm and if what and if I'm able to keep going with this you know mm. mate it was it was mental to watch honestly and I was la I was laughing just so, so much just then because I remember when you when you first did the injury I was like gutted for you watching it as well but I, I remember someone shouting out oh he's got he's got a left arm he's got a left arm and then you, you were like yeah popping it back in and you're like, yeah, I'm good. I'll use the left. And then obviously you hit him with a few shots with the left and he was showboating a lot, wasn't he? And sticking his tongue out and stuff. And I can remember thinking like, he's just so fortunate that that right arm of yours is gone because otherwise he would not be doing that. And I laughed because I remember hearing someone shout, use the right arm. I assume that was your fucking coach, mate. Not some drunk dude <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> nope. <laughs> No, I th I, th I think my coach at the time, Robert Trujillo, I think he mentioned it. He was like, if you're comfortable with it, do it. If not, you know, it is what it is. But of course, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. It's his first time coaching. He's trying to figure out as much as I am, how in the fuck am I able to come away with a win? And he was like, look, it's the last round. If you want to throw the right, my coach did say that, but no, it was the drunk guy yelling it. And and shout out to the opposite coach, who was the other guy from Ohio, Ryan Phillips. He's got a left hand, you know. He happened to say that as I was in the midst of, again, like you said, re resetting my shoulder and trying to know what was going on. So, luckily, you know, people yelling from the crowd uh, and and the the other coach from the other side was able to get things you know enough time for me to get my wherewithal and say hey i will keep going but yeah you know leave it to the drunk guy in the crowd for me to fall for a pressure too i i keep myself together for years before that and then of course it's some drunk guy in a leopard coat if he hadn't done this you know that's the kind of thing where it's like get your dirt bike and jump the fire Fuck yeah. that's the exact kind of thing i felt that moment had turned into <laughs> fucking love it mate and then obviously you um you were obviously able to rehab your shoulder but what was the extent of the injury luckily it was just like a, a um a minor dislocation it wasn't a full dislocation it's like part partial dislocation that's what it's called it was a partial dislocation so it wasn't completely stuck out it was just like the part of the um, the round party order that's in the socket was out so I was able to get in. Um, I get all the medical stuff done, uh, x-rays and MRI. Nothing's torn. There's, you know, I had a torn labrum in my other shoulder. That was, 
Marine Corps career ending injury. They said I didn't have any of that going and that luckily I was going to be a candidate. You know, I shouldn't need surgery for anything. There was no tears or, or breaks or uh, possible micro fractures. But again, that just heals with time. Um, they were like, you're eligible for um, stem cells if you would like to take that route. And of course, I was like, sign me up, you know. They said, uh, my three options would have been go to Florida, go to a location in Las Vegas, or go to a location in California to legally be able to get the stem cells done. You know, shout out to Power Slap again, everyone who I mentioned earlier, the staff and the brass, um, they, they helped me get that done more than they actually had to because I was probably just going to take uh, a trip down to Florida because it's a straight shot almost from Ohio down to Florida over here in the U.S. That would have been what's closest for me because technically they didn't have to pay for the travel. They only had to pay to get the procedure done. But um, following up to Power Slap 3, I get to coach that event because I can't fight. Uh, they hooked me up while I was down there. They got me taken to the facility. They actually, actually, I believe the doctor opened up the building that day on a Saturday for me to be the only one to go in to get the stem cell shot so that way I could get it before I went home without having to, you know, I didn't have to spend a dime on gas. Again, when, like I can't really explain how crazy it is to have the doctor who's giving someone stem cell shots, mind you, pro athletes like uh, you know, like LeBron James would get this, uh, you know, uh, Eli Manning, the Manning brother, any any file athlete that you can think of would get stem cells done. Uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley talks about getting it done. The, you know, the process, at least for what's legal here in America, because it is different depending on where you go. Mm -hmm. they they signed me up on a whim got me directly there with their um on their dime on their time because they did too and they got it taken care of before i was on the come so you know it it really worked out um again if you haven't gone and watched my second fight with azael uh slap five my second title defense him after you know the the horrific battle against wesley you know the stem cells did their job uh, uh the rehab and you know being attentive and really giving myself the time to heal it, you know i was able to come back and we were able to have a five round war and put on a show for the people yeah and was it in your head at all like going into that match were you at all worried about like throwing a hard shot did it change how you competed at all Absolutely, I was worried about it. But in my mind, once I get up there, I mean, I told them I will break my arm off up there doing this again if I have to. If it would have gone the same way, um, I would have done the exact same things I had to to come away with the win or to convince the doctors and the rep was okay to go. I know that the doctors, at least... Um, the ones who were at the fights, he let me know beforehand. He's like, hey, you know, we, we really have been tightening things up and we want to make sure that you understand. So we all understand that, like, that I was lucky that they let it go that far. And I was, you know, tough enough, as some would say, stupid enough, as others would call it, to, to go all the way through that fight and battle through the injury. So, you know, I... Now I, I know for a fact that the doctors are waiting and are ready for me to possibly have an issue. The referees are all waiting to possibly have an issue. The staff's hoping that I'm cleared because um, physical therapy-wise, I was cleared and good to go you know, a, f a few weeks beforehand anyway. But I had to get cleared by the doctor who actually gave me the stem cells like two days before the fight because I had to physically go in and see her and get an evaluation done. So me being actually cleared wasn't done until a couple of days before the fight. And then, you know, in the back of my mind, like you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, what if, what if, what if? But once, once that music plays for the walkout, once you see those lights, all that shit's out the window. In my mind, I'm thinking I'll fucking cut it off if I have to and throw it on the ground so they don't have to worry about it for me to keep going, you know? <laughs> was just was just super happy, not 
not get one, you know, obviously that makes sense for that. But to make it through a five round war with, you know, the guy who obviously the next toughest opponent because he'd gotten two knockouts since we'd competed and, you know, had worked his way back to a title shot. But to go five rounds, not only my chin and that I didn't get a single fight and fall for everybody out there who had an issue with with that stuff happening not a single flinching call not a single penalty on me and i landed i almost knocked him out three times you know i think it was not so much that i couldn't throw as hard i think it was more so as he had learned from that first fight as much as i had learned from you know my air fights of what that five round war could be and Luckily, we were able to, to come away. You know, I was able to come away with the win. We were both able to battle through and not get knocked out. And we were both come away without injury understanding. Yeah, mate. Sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. And have you got another opponent lined up at the moment? I'm lined up right now. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear about that. Um, and I can't officially say anything, but I can say there's a very good likelihood I will be down at the next i don't think it'll be competing but i should be down there and you know once i'm once i make sure that i'm cleared to announce that to everybody I'll definitely you know let you guys know and uh send the info out how i'm gonna be and what i'll be doing yeah awesome and then long term with the sport i mean where do you think power slap's gonna go as a sport because there is obviously comments that people make around I mean, things like CTE and, and the brain trauma. I mean, I feel like because you don't spar throughout the year and you're only getting, you know, whacked a couple of times, it's probably not as bad as, as, as boxing or something. But I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off what you just said. You know, one, one night, which is only an hour of sparring, I get my ass beat more in that one hour of sparring at Muay Thai than I have in all of, all of my power slap competitions you know i'm going to take more punches in a three minute round uh from you know my either my coach or well both coaches because one's a pro fighter and one obviously is a coach for a reason because they know what they're doing but i'm going to get you know i'm going to get beat up by more by the people in there than i am in an actual power slap event you know uh, you get all of these like you were like in piggybacking the the mma guys and the boxing guys are like oh that that's just CTE, you know, brain damage, yada, yada, yada. How many punches did you take in training before you went to compete? How many of you got knocked out in training and didn't do what you're supposed to do and still went and fought anyway? Because that's the kind of stuff that aggravates me is if you have the gall to sit there and talk about, you know, we're all risking it for the biscuit. You, when, no matter what you compete in, whether it's football, uh, you know, CTE is an issue. So CTE is an issue because especially when you're a little kid and you start heading and you're able to hit the ball off your head, brain trauma. Um, trampolines can cause brain trauma when your alarm goes off in the morning and you could cause brain trauma. So I don't think the, the argument is valid. Is it possible? Absolutely, you could get some sort of issue because you're in, you're in a sport where you're the head whether it's a slap whether it's a punch whether it's head to head in football whether it's soccer you know any any, any kind of things and I, and I go with football and soccer because those are two for a fact that the people complaining and talking about they've either played those sports they have someone in their family that they let play those sports, especially when it, you know, children, you're letting children do these things. And I don't care if it's flag football, when you're down on the line for flag football, you're going to smack your head against your opponents repeatedly for practice. So, you know, I, I don't see how any of those points can valid of how could you do this? This is straight going to only be an issue that doesn't work for me. What works for me is we all know what we're signing up for, whether it's any sport across the board. I mean, basketball. How many head trauma injuries are guys getting in basketball when they get knocked down, go into the rim, and they get that whiplash reaction of you know, their head getting whipped, or they get stepped on, or they smack their head off? You know? the, the arguments for all sorts of that stuff can go on for days and days. Um, 
it's you know the the high level medical stuff obviously like i was just talking about the scans that we, we all leave uh the you know again doing what is right to where if you have an, an issue don't go fight them you know we're we're not the ones getting knocked out in sparring because we don't need to spar. The biggest thing we're getting hit with is a piece of foam to keep you mentally um, from getting used to having something come at you without moving. We're not in there getting punched, kicked. You know, if you accidentally take a knee in sparring for MMA and get knocked the fuck out, that's way worse than any sort of slap I think you're ever going to take. If you take a shin to the head from a kick, that might as well be a baseball bat. You know, um... As, as for where we're going to end up, I don't see it going anywhere. We've already broken so many records and so many numbers. And again, when it comes to the medical care that we receive, and it's on you as a competitor to know when you should stop or you when you don't think you're capable of doing this anymore or when you have an issue that you need to get looked at that you you know think, hey, this might be a problem, that is on you as the to get taken care of if it's your time to walk away so be it do not go back out there and do something you you do wholeheartedly believe you should be doing because that is exactly when you're going to get hurt that's exactly when you're going to knocked out and have a problem you know if it if i can't emphasize how much the medical stuff that we have we have the ability to get to see okay you know there's there's always going to be danger if you're afraid of danger, you can wrap yourself in bubble wrap. Go ahead. But we're not, we are not those type of people, obviously. You know, we, we are ready to go out there and do this. So I feel like all of the hate we've gotten, you know, at first it was they're never going to make it to a second event. Well, now we've made it through a whole year with six events going into the seventh one. So you, you notice these comments are literally down to nothing. Oh, you guys are going to get CTE. Well, anyone could get CTE at any point in time from some sort of brain trauma. Um, that it is what it is. Know that. But you know, as for power slap itself, it's only going to get bigger and it's only going to go, you know, more statistic wise up through these ceilings that we keep breaking through because finally a lot of this was just done in the u.s you know we're finally able to bring people over from uh other countries south africa you know south america um over there over there in europe so as as soon as they get a lot of this stuff cleared up you know visa wise i think is the biggest issue once all that's cleared up and our sanctioning is is good to go with more, you know, we're going to be traveling, if not as much as the UFC does. Class. That's so good, though, isn't it? And I think you're right, mate. I think you, you know what you're getting into. So with those arguments, you know, it is risking it for a biscuit. And it? it's, you know what you're doing. If if it, the long-term effects, you know, you don't know now, like none of us know. And like you said, in, in the UK, we have a big thing, uh, obviously, with rugby. We play a lot of rugby in the UK and that has lots of lots of CTE problems and a lot of people have developed like a lot of a lot of issues later on in life. But again, like a lot of the rugby players say they've had a very good life out of it. They've they've provided for their families, they've done lots of things, and they knew effectively what they're getting into. And you know, my my boy, he's eleven, he plays rugby, and it's always a worry with me. I've got him a scrum hat and stuff like that. But he loves the sport, and I think as as men and as, as people, we like to we like to fucking fight. <laughs> You know, we like to see who's the biggest, baddest. We, w- we want to do this sort of thing. And like you said, it, how much it's changed your life and your family's life already, and it's only the start of it, you know, I, I don't think, you know, you would change it for the world. But I think also, John, as well, you mentioned, mate, about like it's sometimes around the behavior that you you kind of have when you've been hurt as well. And I think a lot of the CT that you typically see are from like a time when the athletes, you know, they would get sparked out on the pitch and they'd be up getting sparked out again on the pitch, you know, and you see people getting repeatedly knocked out week in, week out in games. And I think there was a, obviously a massive ignorance to it, you know, from the medical sort of professionals and, and sort of sports science, which we obviously have a lot more awareness now. And like you say, if you have been hurt or if you've had your, your kind of, you know, your bell rung, then then you just need to take the appropriate time off and, I think the long-term damage will be far reduced, 100%.
Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing you, you hear a lot, especially in the heyday of these guys that had these MMA camps coming up. And they were breaking each other's legs and snapping each other's arms and knocking each other the fuck <laughs> yeah. out all the time. You know, for, for any one of them, and I'm not going to point fingers, but for any one of them to be like, you should never do this. This is dangerous. This is CTE waiting to happen. Who are you to tell any of us what we should or should not do? You've come from training camps where you guys have annihilated people, including yourselves, because if you're doing that to someone, then obviously it's probably happened to you in the process of some of your training. Like you said, when we train this, granted, I'm not going to say no one's ever said, hey, you to slap me as hard as I can so that way I can see if I have it. By all means, if you want to test that out at home so you're not on a live stream in front of millions of people, <laughs> do it. So that way if you go out, you're falling in the grass, you're falling on padding, something like that. Um, this this idea of, oh, we're uh, martial artists, never, we would never be a part of that or want to see that. I don't, I, I don't think that argument can be valid. Because you said, Danny, we are, as humans, there is violence through our existence, naturally, and, and it's also part of a competitive factor that comes down to see who's the, who can be the toughest, who can be the strongest, who can be the toughest, and for us, it's who can go up there and not only throw a precision strike that may or may not but who can sit there and eat a precision strike that could have been a knockout and look completely unfazed because it has happened yeah, to plenty of people. Crazy. You know, you, you take the hit and you go, now what? And you see the look of, when you can see the look of defeat, other person's face, cause now they have to go back and they're like, Oh fuck dude. I, I get that absolutely everything I had and somehow that will be on the other side of the table is still standing and is ready to go it's it's like 3d chess even though a power slap may be so simple there's much more to it than just the physical activity and the physical training of it yeah mate honestly it's a fascinating sport if it ever came to the uk's live event i'd oh, fucking mate, be yeah, in a heartbeat yeah. i think mean, it'd be great i reckon you'd be quite good at slamming you got a big melon head yeah i got a big melon head and fucking <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's awesome. Uh, mate, we, we've had you long enough, mate. So we'll, uh, we'll let you go in a second. But do you want to shout out anybody before we uh, before you sign off? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, shout out to Power Slap themselves. Again, everyone I listed, the, the brass, the matchmakers, everyone over there, because without them figuring everything out and pushing us, you know, we, we might not have these opportunities, again, for me to sit down here and talk with you. Uh, I'd like to shout out, again, my gym, Next Level Alliance. Anyone watching this, if you're in Ohio, Please come out there and, you know, get into something, do something with your life, whether it's just for a hobby or you want to train and get into, you know, I'll train you in power slap. They'll teach you jujitsu and Muay Thai. You'll learn a whole bunch of stuff and you get to be in an atmosphere that we as people need to be in. Um, you know, shout out to my sponsors, The Boot Life. Uh, they were uh you know, first sponsor I got and definitely helpful and learning all of the processes that go on through this. And, uh, you know, shout out to my family, my wife and kids, they sacrifice more than most people can really think or try and relate to. Well, not only with I'm when I'm gone competing, but I have to not only keep my, my weight on because I could easily blow up, but I have to make sure that I'm working hard and instantly being consistent because if I fall off, I'm not going to be there anymore. I'm not going to, maybe I'm going to miss opportunity because I wanted to be lazy at home. So, and shout out to my wife and kids because they motivate me on my worst days. They motivate me on my best days, you know, and thank you guys very much so uh, for, for having me on and appreciate it very much. No, it's an absolute pleasure, mate. And I've, I've really enjoyed your career so far, mate, and wish you the absolute best moving forward. But yeah, thanks for your time, buddy. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.